If you would, open up your Bibles with me to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, we're going to look at verse 26 of Romans chapter 3. The book of Romans is a very, very straightforward exposition of the gospel message. In fact, the reformer Martin Luther, to speak of the Protestant Reformation, called it the purest gospel. And it truly is. It's a, a clear explanation on how we are saved. It is by faith alone in the finished work of Christ alone. So Romans chapter 3, verse 26 reads this. Paul is writing here. And he's speaking of salvation, specifically the work of Christ upon the cross. He says... Concerning the Father's relation to Christ's work on the cross. For the demonstration, I say, of His righteousness at the present time. So that He would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, asking that He would bless the preaching of His word. Father in heaven, I plead for you to grant me much grace to exposit the scriptures to make known the glory of the gospel, to hold forth the manna from heaven that your people might feed upon it, that their souls might be nourished upon the bread of life, the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray for any lost souls in this place, that they would be born again into the kingdom of God this very night, that they would not be able to lay their heads upon a pillow until they are right with the Lord Jesus Christ, until they see themselves as being found in him, not having a righteousness of their own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. And I pray, Father, that above all else, your name and the name of Christ Jesus would be lifted high in this place. That you would receive all the glory in salvation, all the glory in the preaching of your word. For you have so ordered the economy of salvation to bring your name glory. And so I pray all these things through our mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The title of this sermon is The Just Justifier. The just justifier. In Scripture, we have a dilemma that is presented to us. It is the chiefest of all dilemmas. And it is this. How can God be both holy and righteous and pure, and yet still gracious and compassionate toward the wicked? How can God uphold His righteousness and administer grace at the same time? How can God be, as spoken of in Scripture, wrathful, yet we see that He also has love and forgives and pardons sinners? How can it be that God is a holy and righteous God, yet He is also gracious and merciful? Exodus 34 presents this very well. It says in verse 6, Then the Lord passed by in front of Him, that is Moses, on the top of Mount Sinai. It says, he, and he proclaimed to Moses, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression and sin, and he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Therein do we find this parallel. We have these attributes of God put before our eyes. It says he forgives sin, yet what does it say? He cannot leave the guilty unpunished. Brethren, I have great joy to say that the problem has been solved. The dilemma has been resolved in the cross of our Lord. It has been resolved through the finished work of Christ. The attributes of God come together in glorious unity at the cross of our Savior, where the wrath of God was displayed and the mercy and love of God was displayed. Therefore, this evening, I would like us to consider four things. Firstly, the righteousness of God. Secondly, the grace of God. Thirdly, that great dilemma. I want to explain that further. And then fourthly, how that dilemma. Precisely, how is it resolved in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? Before I do that, of course, I want to just quickly remind us of the context here of Romans 3, what Paul is saying here in this chapter. At the beginning half of, of the chapter in verses 1 through 20, he is bringing forth a summarization of all that he has said thus far in this book. In chapter 1 and chapter 2, he outlined the depravity of man. He talked very clearly in chapter 1 about the pagans being lost. The pagans, the irreligious people, were obviously they're lost. Obviously they know not Christ. 
Chapter 2, then he shows us that the religious hypocrite as well is lost and needs salvation. And then he brings it all together, as it were, in chapter 3. And quotes a lengthy portion of Old Testament scriptures showing us how lost man truly is. That he hates God, he will not seek after God, he has turned aside, he does not do good, his feet are swift to shed blood. But then at the end of chapter 3 we find that Paul brings forth the gospel. He brings forth the remedy to this issue of sin. And it is what? He says in verse 21, But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. So what is the gospel? That God imputes to the sinner a righteousness that is not their own. Namely, the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as he goes down in the next few verses, he explains exactly what Christ's work upon the cross accomplished. That being propitiation. That's what he says in verse 25. He says, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. And then that brings us to the doorstep of verse 26, which is what I want us to consider this evening. And specifically, the phrase that I want us to consider in verse 26 is where Paul says God is just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Firstly, let us consider the righteousness of God. God is righteous. The word righteous is, of course, derived from the English word right. He does what is right, not what is wrong. In all his ways, he is pure. We find this in Psalm 119, 137. It says, righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. Just as we read from, uh, or just as my brother read from Psalm 119, the psalmist there lifts up praise unto God for being righteous and being a just God and administering judgments. Deuteronomy 32 tells us that God's work is perfect, for all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. God is described in the book of Genesis as well as the judge of all the earth. That is, he sits on his holy tribunal, as it were, and he sees the thoughts, the attitudes, the intentions of the heart of man. He sees their sin and he holds them accountable for it. And as we just read from Exodus 34, he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. That's emphatic. He could have just said he will not leave the guilty unpunished. But no, he said he will by no means in other words, it is an impossibility. He will not do it. His hand will not be moved. His character will not be thwarted. He will not compromise. He will not move to the left or to the right. He is holy. And we must realize this. We must realize how holy God is. Scripture says no man can stand in his presence. But not only is God at present holy and just and righteous, but there is a sense in which Scripture speaks of His coming holiness, His coming justice, that being in the eschaton, the end times, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in Psalm 36, verse 18, Before the Lord, for He is coming, for He is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in His faithfulness. So many people sit in pews in the United States in churches, even in this very county, most churches in this county. And they know not of the holiness of God because the holiness of God is not preached. Because the righteousness of God is not preached. We must grasp this reality, brethren. We must see this. You lost folks, you must see this. You unconverted souls, you must see this. You can only, insofar, you can only see God's grace insofar as your soul has been brought to fear His wrath. You can only see the love of God insofar as you know that you deserve the justice of God upon your soul. Understanding God's holiness is tremendously effective in bringing souls into the kingdom. Oftentimes, what do evangelicals say? We need to, we need to love on people. 
We need to be tolerant. We need to be gracious. What is loving, brethren? To tell the truth. Let us wound them with the truth and comfort them with lies. Let us preach the gospel. Let us shoot the arrow of the gospel that it might penetrate the heart and go to the inner man and save them from eternal destruction. We think about uh, our, our forefathers according to the faith. A, a man of the faith, a great giant like Jonathan Edwards, who preached his most famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Preached that sermon with passion and vigor. He preached it. And not only that, but as he was preaching the very sermon itself, he was multiple times interrupted by sinners crying out for mercy and asking him what must they do to be saved. After that sermon was preached, over 500 people were converted in the immediate aftermath. And who knows how many souls have been born into the kingdom of God in these recent decades and centuries since that sermon was released in print. We think about the prophet Isaiah, who was one of the most holy men in his day. This man was not a lukewarm Christian. He was not someone that the Lord Jesus would have spat out of his mouth. He is not someone who is a typical Southern Baptist churchgoer here in Lawrence County. He was a holy man. He was a holy man. And what do we find in Isaiah 6? He says, in the, king, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord enthroned. And he describes in detail seeing God with his own eyes. We know later also from John 12 that he actually saw the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was so struck with fear, he said, Woe is me, for I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Interesting there, he also describes in that very chapter the two seraphim who were there in heaven praising God. And he writes down what they were saying to one another. He says they were crying out to one another these words. Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. That is significant because these angels, these angelic hosts, had a loss for words. Therefore, they had to repeat. They had to repeat. It wasn't vain repetition uh, what, like what we hear a lot of religious people these days saying. No, it was repetition in the sense that we don't have any other words to describe the character of the one whose eyes or who is before our eyes. We can't describe his glory. Theologians have often described the holiness of God as his beauty. So it makes him beautiful. Because what does the word holy mean? It means sacred, set apart, sanctified. Set apart from this perverse world. Set apart from you and me. Not only has God in the abstract revealed to us that He is holy, but He has, as it were, spelt it out in His law. He has shown us how He is holy. In His hatred for lying. In His hatred for thievery. In His hatred for adultery. In His hatred for homosexuality and sexual perversion. He has shown His hatred for all sin. He has shown his absolute disgust concerning idolatry. That shows us how God is holy. But the bad news is that we have broken that law. That law which reveals unto us God's beauty, which is a mirror as it were. We've broken it. As Paul says there in Romans chapter 3, listen to what he says in verse 10. He's quoting the Old Testament, so he's standing upon the authority of the, of the Scriptures that are already written at this point. He says, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. Okay, that, if, as if that weren't enough, what does he say? There is not even one. Not even one. I could go on and read, but time will flee from me too quickly if I were to do so. Brethren, suffice it to say that you and I both know that you and I have broken God's law. I myself encountered a man yesterday, by the grace of God, was able to share the gospel with him. He was a Catholic man, and he was very quick to proclaim his unrighteousness. And when I confronted him with the truth of the law of God, he became convicted. But not at first. He had to press. No, I have not broken God's law. And toward the end of the conversation, I said, Sir... You know that you've broken God's law. And your conscience screams at you concerning the fact that you've broken God's law. And his mouth was shut. He didn't have anything to say. Wasn't that I was clever? It's just what Scripture says. That's what the Word of God says. And not only that, but I've experienced that. 
My conscience has testified to the fact that I've broken God's law. We are the enemies of God by nature. We are His adversaries. We are those that are the objects of His wrath. Those who are outside of Christ. Nahum 1-2 says, A jealous and avenging God is Yahweh. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on His adversaries and He reserves wrath for His enemies. What do we do when we go to a nice restaurant? We ask them to reserve us a table. God is reserving wrath for the wicked. He's setting it aside. He's marking it out. So there is a hopelessness in light of the holiness of God because of our unholiness. It's not that God in Himself is the, is the issue. It's not that God's character is the problem. It's not that God's law is the problem. Even a lot of men in the Reformed tradition will sometimes undervalue the role of God's law, sacrificed on the altar of a particular hermeneutical standpoint. But brethren, the law of God is perfect. Psalm 19 said it restores the soul. Let us put the law of God all around us. Let, it, let us establish it in our courtrooms. Let us put it in the public schools. That the heart of man might be convicted and ultimately look to who? What's the law for? Pointing us to Christ, Amen. the law fulfiller. So, the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God, which is commonly spoken of in the book of Romans. Really, that, uh, I know, I've heard theologians say that that's really one of the themes of the book of Romans. Righteousness from God, or the righteousness of God. Paul says in Romans 1.18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Literally translated, is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. The righteous indignation of, of God's wrath, the, the burning anger of God, is revealed from heaven against the wicked. Secondly, let us consider, though, the grace of God. So now we have this one aspect of the character of God, but also we must consider, we must do, do a full service to the counsel of God. And Scripture clearly speaks to this reality that God is gracious, compassionate, abounding, and loving kindness. What do we find in 1 John 1 9? If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is gracious. Ephesians 1 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. It was not enough for the Apostle Paul to say his grace, he had to say the riches of his grace, because, brethren, we have been made rich in Christ. God forgives sinners out of his grace. Perhaps now you're beginning to see there is a seeming contradiction, because I just said God will not forgive the sinner, his wrath is revealed from heaven against the sinner. He has burning indignation against the sinner. And then I turn around and say from Scripture that God forgives the sinner. Indeed, I do. Going back to Isaiah, Isaiah 118. God, he, God invites, He entices the sinner. Listen to the, listen to the compassion of God come forth out of this text. Come now and let us reason together, says Yahweh. Though your sins are as scarlet... They will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. One of my favorite texts in Scripture, and um, I'd love to go to it, but um, it would take too much time to do so, is found in Isaiah 55, when, when the invitation is, Come, mm -hmm. drink, get wine, get milk, get bread without money, without cost. That's not talking about a physical wine, milk, and bread. This is spiritual. The bread of life, Christ, is free. The offer of salvation is free. It goes out to all the world. The grace of God is abundant. Riches of grace. Riches of grace. Or as Paul says in Ephesians 2, but God being rich in mercy. Oh, He's rich in grace? Also mercy? What do we find also in Jeremiah? Jeremiah. I have loved you with an everlasting love. God has set His love upon His elect before the worlds were made. It is revealed to us, you who are saved, you who are in Christ, you have experienced this great grace, this amazing grace, as the song speaks. You yourselves can testify to the fact that God forgives sin. God justifies. God pours out, sheds abroad His love within the hearts of His people. 
by the Spirit whom He's given to them. And therefore we find ourselves at the great dilemma. And that's why I want us to thirdly consider. How can both these things be? How can God do this? It's a contradiction. Is it not? And my heart breaks to know that many Christians cannot explain this. That if an unbeliever brought this to their attention, said, you Christians believe in a God who reveals Himself to be holy and righteous, yet it also says He's gracious and He forgives, you believe in a God who contradicts Himself. It breaks my heart to know that Christians do not know the solution to this problem. Christians do not know how to answer back. Brethren, the answer is simple. The dilemma is resolved in the gospel. It is resolved in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what I want to fourthly consider. And I want to spend most time on this very subject. The cross of the Lord Jesus Christ was a display of the righteousness of God, the holiness of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, all the attributes of God come together as it were, and they meet in harmony. Not that they ever were in disunity. Not that they were ever at odds with one another. It was just that the mind of man could not understand. That's why when oftentimes when I'm preaching the gospel, I say, people, this is not something I came up with. This is not something that protruded forth out of the mind of men. This is not according to the wisdom of men. What man could think of such beauty, of such wonder and glory? You who are saved know what I'm talking about. The beauty of the gospel. The beauty of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's interesting because we often hear about the cross spoken, uh, spoken about all the time. Especially us in Southern Baptist circles. We're known for our strong evangelism. Or so it is called. And we hear a lot about the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus died for sinners. Jesus died. Jesus died for sinners. He died for you. Come. Or so they say. But what does that mean? What does that mean that Jesus died? You, I need more. I need more depth. And you know what? The apostles gave more depth. The apostles explained what Jesus did. Not just that He did it. It is, it is not sufficient to just say Jesus did die. That is a summarization of what He did. But let us go further, brethren. Let us reveal the full treasures of the gospel. It is a treasure, brethren, and it's hidden up in a chest, as it were. And what we do when we say Jesus died for you merely, we're just cracking the chest open and the sinner only gets a slight view. Let us fling it open. Let us break the hinges off and never close it again. Let us have it exposed. Let, let it pour forth and let them see that they can be rich in Christ. The cross of Christ. The cross of Christ. There's two things I want to speak on concerning the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Firstly, it is Christ bearing the sins of His people. Christ bearing the sins of His people. We find in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, Peter writes, He Himself bore our sins in His body on the cross. We also find in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it says, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Now we ask ourselves, what does this mean? What does it mean that Christ Jesus became sin for us? What does it mean that He carried our iniquities? What does it mean that He became a, a curse for us, to use the terminology that is employed by Paul in Galatians 3? What, what, is, what does Peter mean when he says He bore our sins in His body? It is this. He took ownership of our rebellion. He took ownership of our iniquity. He took ownership. That is, the Father accounted over to His account. He, he regarded Him as if He had lived our lives. Oftentimes, Reformed and Calvinistic theologians speak on what is called imputation. And oftentimes they talk about the sinner receiving the imputed righteousness of Christ. But brethren, there was also another imputation that took place. And that was our sin to Christ's account. Amen. It was an imputation. It was a dual. There's a dual imputation that goes on in justification. Jesus takes the sin of His people upon Himself. What does impute mean? It means to credit to, to account over to, to reckon as. So when we read in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, when it says, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. We read there and we say, Jesus Christ certainly never became a sinner. He certainly never sinned. 
He certainly never displeased the Father. But what is meant by that is this, that the Father looked upon His Son and regarded Him as a sinner. He regarded Him as a lawbreaker and He damned Him as it were. He accursed Him. He was cut off from the people. Upon the cross, Christ Jesus took ownership of our sin. Now let that sink in. Let, let, your, let your mind consider your iniquities and your transgressions. Think about not only the outward sins that you have committed against God, but the inward things that you have done. The inward perversions. The inward iniquities that you've committed. The thoughts. The hatred. The sexual immorality. And think that upon that cross, Christ took ownership of that. That the, the debt of His people, the account of the children of God was moved over. All, their, of their negative account, all the negative aspect that's in their account is moved over to His. So the Father requires of Him the wrath that's due unto us. This is clearly brought forth in Isaiah 53. And I would invite you to turn there. Because we're going to spend a few minutes there. Isaiah 53. Written 700 years before the Lord Jesus Christ was born. 700 years. Seven centuries before Christ was a thought in His parents' mind. Before they were a thought in their parents' mind. And so on and so forth. This was in detail. These aren't vague terms, brethren. Verse 3 of Isaiah 53. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Verse 4. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Brethren, Look at, look at how emphatic this text is. It doesn't say he was, he was regarded as if he committed our sin. It's as if he actually bore our sin because he did bear our sin. Words cannot describe the depth of the Lord Jesus Christ's sorrow upon the cross. That place where the Father counted him as a lawbreaker. But he was, verse 5, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. Verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears. So he did not open his mouth. Verse 8, by oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. Christ bore in his body our sin. Not just the great sins, but the little ones. And not just some of the sins of the people of God, but every last one of the sins of the people of God. And he died for a people, for a specific people, for his people. Secondly, I want us to consider this aspect of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. The satisfaction of the wrath of the Father. Look at verse 10. In my opinion, verse 10 is the most precious verse in this entire chapter. Listen carefully. But Yahweh was pleased to crush Him. Therein do we find the gospel message. Therein do we find the cardinal point of the Christian faith. Therein do we find why our forefathers burned at the stake for the gospel. Because it is this truth that changes hearts. It is this truth that way awakens a, a sinner who is dead in sin. That the wrath of the Father was unleashed upon Christ, but not only unleashed, but absolutely satisfied. Not an ounce left. And therefore the prophet could write in the inspiration of the Spirit of God, Yahweh was pleased. He was not halfway pleased. He was not 
somewhat pleased. He was not mostly pleased. He was pleased. There is not an ounce that we can possibly offer up to God in an ounce of righteousness because the work of Christ upon the cross is sufficient. Recently, we had the Protestant Reformation just last week. 500 years ago, Martin Luther pinned the 95 Theses on the castle church door in Wittenberg, Germany, thus sparking the Protestant Reformation. Praise be to God that God got His people out of the whore of Babylon. But the whore is still around, brethren. And she is still spewing lies. She is still bringing with her souls to hell. They are still there. Those Catholics are making other people sons and daughters, twice the sons and daughters of hell as themselves. Why is that? Because essentially, Catholic theology says that the Lord was not fully pleased to crush him. That the wrath of the Father was not fully put away. That's what they're saying. When the blasphemy of the Mass is, is, is produced, is, is, is practiced in these so-called churches, which are really houses of Satan, dens of demons, and these people supposedly eat the bread and body of the Lord Jesus Christ, they are in effect saying, Jesus, what you did on the cross 2,000 years ago was not enough. It was not effectual. It was not sufficient. And it's not enough. I've got to have some goofy uh, priest stand in my place for me before you, bless some bread and wine, and I'll drink it, and then I'll be saved. Let no man say such things. And even as we, as Baptists, oftentimes, Baptist evangelists, what do they preach? They preach the same thing. They did. A vain ritualism. Just pray this prayer, you're saved. Walk the aisle, you're saved. Do this church ritual. To fill in the blank. It's the same thing that the same thing Catholics do. Eat the mass, you'll be saved. We do the same thing. Do this religious ritual. It's like your IV shot. Or excuse me, it's like your flu shot. You're good, you're good to go. No. That's not salvation. Salvation is trusting in the finished work of Christ. But the Lord was pleased to crush him. What is hell, my friends? What is hell? What is that place that we ought to fear going to? It is the place where God administers to the wicked that which they deserve. And that is His wrath. It's interesting, a lot of times people uh, begin to conceive in their minds an idea of hell that is unbiblical. They think that Satan's there with a pitchfork poking people in the back. Hell is not that at all. God is there. God is there, my friends, and God is there in the full fury of His wrath against the wicked. Why do you think Scripture calls us to fear God? Fear God. Because what did our Lord Jesus say? He will destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Who will? He will. What is often again spoken of in Baptist circles just to hate on our own kinds because it tends to, it tends to be better when we rebuke our own kind. Because the world will say, you're rebuking the Catholics, you're rebuking the, the liberal Presbyterians over here. Brethren, we have issues in our own circles. Many issues. So let's call out the issues in our own circles. What do we have people say? God doesn't send people to hell. People bring themselves to hell. No, God sends people to hell. Because God is holy. Because God is holy. However, God is so merciful, so merciful. We see it in the cross. We see the holiness of God. We see that God does not sweep sin under the rug. I encounter this every, I mean, I'm serious. Every time I run into someone who's a Christian, there is a rare exception, very rare. They say they're a Christian. I say, okay, if you die today and you stand before God, how are you going to go to heaven? How are you going to enter into the pearly gates, as it were? How are you going to stand in the presence of the Holy One? Well, I... Blank. Fill it in. Well, I've always been a Christian. I grew up as a Christian. I was baptized. I pray every night. I try my best. I, I, I. Instead, it ought to be Christ mm -hmm. did this for me. Christ suffered in my stead, in my room, in my place. 
The gracious attributes of God, the mercy, the love, the care, the compassion of the Father revealed in the death of His Son. What does Romans 5 tell us? That the Father demonstrated His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then what does he also say in that chapter? One will hardly die for a righteous man. One is hard, someone who will hardly die for someone who's, who's morally has moral rectitude. But God demonstrates his own love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It wasn't when we were in a state of neutrality, because that never was. It wasn't that we were okay. It's that God's love is so overwhelming and it is so great that it it absolutely accomplishes a salvation for his people. Because before the foundation of the world, he set aside a people unto himself and he's covenanted with the son. He commissioned the son to die for that people and the son agreed and he came in space and time. The spirit equipped the son to do that and he accomplished redemption for his people. Verse 10 of Isaiah 53, listen to what it says. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. He will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Brethren, this is covenantal language. There's a reward that the son is going to get for his sufferings. Verse 10, as a result of the, or excuse me, verse 11. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many... As he will bear their iniquities, therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong. Because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. The covenant of redemption, the glorious covenant transaction that happened before the world was made, before the Father and the Son and even the Spirit joined in on it. Concerning us, we're of what's being spoken about between the members of the Trinity in eternity past. Our salvation, our souls, our eternity. In fact, Jesus speaks of the Father giving us to Him. What do we find in Ephesians 5, 25? Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for her. Think about that. What is marriage? A reflection of Christ's love for His church. Jesus has such a great love for His people. That's why He went to the cross. That's why He suffered the pains of death. That's why He bore the wrath of the Father. But not only that, in His body did He suffer, but what does the text say in in Isaiah 53, 11? As a result of the anguish of His soul, let no creature merely make mention of the physical sufferings of Christ so as to do injustice to His suffering. There was much more beyond that. And that was this. That Christ in his soul suffered. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So we find that the wrath of the Father is poured out on Christ upon the cross. Every ounce, every sin, nothing is let back. There is no abatement. There is no holding back. It is all go. And think about this. Hell never ends for the wicked. And so we find the eternality, the infinite price that must be paid in order to be freed from the shackles of iniquity. In order for someone to be saved, there must be an infinite price paid. And so we have the infinite Son of God coming, dying a perfectly satisfactory death upon the cross because He could pay an infinite price. Because He is the infinite God. He could pay that price for our redemption. So the Father unleashed His wrath, and it was all in just a matter of a few hours gone? Absolutely. Why? Because of the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. Let's go back to Romans 3 briefly. Because Paul speaks of this in Romans 3. Romans 3.25, which is the verse before the verse that I'm wanting to highlight this evening. It says this concerning Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. The word propitiate means wrath has been absorbed to make appeasement. Wrath has been absorbed. I've tried to describe it to my siblings this way. There's a cup of water on the counter. You take a, a huge sponge and you stuff it in, the, in the, the, uh, the, the, the glass of water and pull it out. There's not a drop left. It's all been absorbed into the sponge. 
And it was as if the Lord Christ became a sponge to absorb the wrath of the Father, and there's not a drop left. It's all gone. And so therein do we find that the attributes of God come together, that God can still uphold His holiness and uphold His righteousness and uphold His justice, and yet He can administer grace and kindness and love toward His people. The attributes of God come together. They clasp hands. They meet. They covenant with one another, as it were. They're married at the cross, and they will never be separated. They are inexorably linked The famed Bible commentator Matthew Henry said this on this verse. Mercy and truth are so met together. Righteousness and peace have so kissed one another that it is now because not only an act of grace and mercy, but an act of righteousness in God to pardon the sins of penitent believers, having accepted the satisfaction that Christ by dying made to his justice for them. Brethren, if someone asks you, how do you know that you're forgiven? Do not merely say, because God is gracious, say God is gracious and God is just. And He will not punish the same sin twice. It is an impossibility for the elect to suffer in hell. If you're in Christ, it is an impossibility for you to ever be lost. It's not just that it won't happen, it could not ever happen. You will never see hell You will never taste of the fires of hell if you're in Christ. Because God will not punish the same sin twice. Think about that. In the state of South Carolina, let's say that we had a judge who had a murderer that stood before him. And uh, his bail was set. Or let's say, um, just to bear with me here. Let's say that he has a fine. And he can pay a fine and he'll be free. This is not obviously to accuracy in reality. But let's say he had a fine. $3 million dollars. And if if he paid it, he would not have to go to prison. He could be freed. He could walk away. So he is hopeless, obviously. He can't rub two pennies pennies together. He's a murderer. He's a poor man. And yet someone comes in, and out of a love for this man who did not deserve it, pays the fine for him, is set free, and he will never see prison. He can walk away. And that's precisely what the work of Christ is. He pays the fine. He pays the bail, as it were. He purchases redemption for us. But let me ask you, brethren, would the judge the next day call up the man and say, Sir, there's a cruiser coming to pick you up. We're going to have to throw you in prison. Surely not, because why? The judge is just. He upholds justice. How much more with God, brethren? So set your hope on the justice of God. For therein do we find in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is merciful and gracious. No, oh, I'm sorry. No, wait. It says he is faithful and, and righteous to forgive us our sins. Some translations say faithful and just. So let us, brethren, rest in that reality. This is out of the wisdom of God. Think of, no man could have thought of this. This could not have come from a man. This came from heaven. This is the heavenly gospel that God authors, that he owns That he has brought about for his glory. That upon the cross all the attributes of God come together in glorious unity. As individual voices of a choir, as it were, to sing a heavenly melody for our ears to hear. All redounding to the glory of God. A few exhortations for you, my dear saints. Worship this great God revealed in the gospel. What does the gospel produce? What does Christ's work upon the cross uh, produce in the the hearts of the people of God? Praise. It ignites praise. Oh, brethren, are you lacking in zeal? Are you lacking in, in exuberant worship for God? Look to the gospel. Look to Christ. Look to the attributes of God as they've been revealed in the cross of our Savior. And watch as the Spirit of God produces within you Worship. We think about the psalmist, David, who often wrote beautiful psalms of praise to God, and yet his eyes looked from afar and saw Christ. He did not know in detail of what Jesus would do. What did he know? He knew he'd be king. He knew he'd crush the skull of the serpent. And that was enough 
That was enough for in this man to produce such worship to God. Brethren, how much more now in this new dispensation do we find ourselves looking to the full revelation of the gospel of grace? How much more should we be filled with praise toward the Most High for all that He has done for us in His Son? As the hymn puts it, how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. But brethren, do not sit idle. You who are old even, do not sit idle. Use these years of your life to proclaim this gospel, to preach it unto this lost and dying world. Where Shoals needs the gospel. Mm -hmm. Brethren, from the mouth of our Lord, most of Where Shoals is going to hell. Mm -hmm. Most of Clinton, which is, where, which is where I live, is going to hell. Most of Lawrence is going to hell. How do we know that? Jesus said it. Matthew 7, many are on the road, the broad path to destruction. Let us hold forth the gospel. Let us go out to the highways and the byways and compel them. Let us go to the gas stations. Let us go wherever they will have us be and preach Christ and Him crucified. Hand out tracts. You who say, well, there's not much that I can do for Christ. Oh, brethren, to sow the seed of the gospel through tract distribution is a glorious grace. I think about my grandfather who could not explain to you the gospel. Because of his ignorance. Having a third grade education. He couldn't. He couldn't put it in words. He couldn't describe to you what righteousness, holiness, justice, grace means. He couldn't. And yet I see this man. When he pays his bills every month. He asks me for a stack of gospel tracts. So he can insert them in his bills. Brethren, let us take those few moments out of our day and preach Christ. That is proclamation of the gospel. And my grandfather at least knows this, that in that tract is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And most of those people are probably on the road to destruction. And I ought to put this in there because they ought need Christ. Let us not hate the world. You know what's hateful? It's to do what the liberals tell us to do and hold back the gospel. Yeah. That's hateful. Yeah. Because what are we saying to the world? Go to hell. Go to hell. For you who are hypocrites, you religious hypocrites, examine yourselves. How do you know if you're a religious hypocrite if your trust isn't in this? Exclusively in this. What did Jesus say in, in Luke 14, 33? You cannot be my disciple if you do not renounce all your possessions. And brethren, that includes whatever someone, whatever claim someone has to righteousness. They must renounce that. They must say, my righteousness, as Isaiah 64, 6 says, is a filthy rag. You who have been in church for many years, perhaps, but have not trusted in Christ alone, you need to repent and believe the gospel. I pastor a church, as was mentioned, just down the street, and my people could be unconverted. I don't know their hearts. I plead with them, look to Christ. For some, I'm hopeful. From, for, for others, I'm less hopeful. But I'm not going to give them a false assurance. And God forbid that your pastors here should do so to you. Let us exhort even those who sit next to us in the pews to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Especially the young ones. I was a false convert for eight years. I was raised Southern Baptist. I had saved the sinner's prayer. I was baptized. But I was also addicted to pornography. I was also a drunkard. I was also a lover of the world. I was also, uh, used filthy language, employed blasphemous language against the God who had made me. I knew not Christ. I was lost. I thought it was cool to be like the world. Let us plead with our children, our grandchildren, even if they profess Christ, to look to Christ. And for you who perhaps do not even profess to know Christ, the call is still the same. Repent and believe. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes will in Him have eternal life. So in conclusion, we have seen...
the righteousness of God. We have seen the grace of God. We have seen how that brings about the great dilemma, but we have seen how in the gospel that great dilemma is brought forth and it is resolved. And so God can be the just justifier. God can be both holy and gracious. Wrathful and loving because of our Savior, Christ Jesus. We have sinned against God. We've broken His law, as mentioned earlier. And we deserve hell. But as I said, the Father set aside a people to Himself. And Christ died for that people. He lived for that people. Not only did He die, but He lived for them and was raised on the third day. He is alive today, exalted in glory at the right hand of the majesty on high. And the call of the gospel is to repent and believe, to flee sin and to flee to the Savior. And the promise is that your sins will be pardoned. And you'll be wrapped in the righteousness of Christ. Just as his sin was in, your sin was imputed to him upon the cross, so too will his righteousness be imputed to you if you're his. It is all by grace. And those who are in Christ are changed forever. They have a new nature, a new heart, and a new desire. A desire to serve, please, and honor God. All by grace, brethren. Regardless of what this world says, regardless of what the lost religious hypocrites all around us say, it's by grace. Why? Because God is jealous for the glory. The gospel reveals the character of God. Why? Because God is jealous for His glory. God is jealous to bring His name glory. And so we see, not only in the gospel, but in all creation, it redounds to His glory. And so may God be glorified in all things as they forever redound to His glory through Christ Jesus, our mediator. Let us close in a word of prayer. O oh God, our great God, how wonderful are you, O oh Lord. We praise you and we honor you. We bow before you, as it were. We humble ourselves and we ascribe to you glory and, and praise and honor. I pray, Father, that the word would have its intended effect, that the Holy Spirit would take the word that has been preached and would do with it as he pleases. And I pray, as I said, that you would be glorified in myself and all the hearers, Father, in this church, in this community, in this nation, in all things, as they redound to your glory. And we pray all these things because Jesus Christ died for us and procured eternal redemption. Amen and amen.